glad that you are able to join us today. So if you are new to this, we are excited to have you join us. We typically have a Frontiers in Science speaker once every semester. That's been put on hold for a little bit and we're happy and excited to be back. This is being recorded so that others can watch at a later time. Today's topic is confronting vaccine myths in COVID times. And we are joined by two of our NWTC staff today, Matt Peterson and Angelo Kolokithis. Matt Peterson completed his Bachelor's of Science in Exercise Science at Truman State University and then completed a PhD in Human Physiology at the Medical College of Wisconsin, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in the Biotechnology and Bioengineering Center at Freighter Hospital in Milwaukee. He has worked at NWTC since 2007 in a number of roles, including teaching anatomy and physiology, microbiology, and general biology. His current role is manager of student retention, and he also manages the student COVID response team. Angelo Kolokithis completed his bachelor's of science in cell and molecular biology at San Diego State University. From there, he worked in the biotechnology sector, Later, he completed a PhD in biomolecular structure and dynamics and retrovirology at the National Institutes of Health. He has worked at NWTC since 2011, teaching microbiology, general biology, cell and molecular biology, experimental design, and also runs summer undergraduate research at NWTC in virology. Both gentlemen are also instructors in our laboratory science technology program, a two-year associate degree program. Welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Heidi, for the introduction, and I'm really happy to be here with everybody today and thrilled to be presenting along with my good friend and respected colleague, Angelo Kolokithis. Um, just a note about questions today. We will have a session at the end of the presentation today for questions, but if you have a question along the way, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, while I'm speaking, Angelo will be monitoring the chat and I'll do I'll do likewise as Angelo speaks. And if we see a question pop up that isn't going to be answered later on in the in the talk, we'll we'll just jump in and ask that question at that moment. So if you feel like your question is being ignored, please know it's not. Um, that that hang tight and it'll come up uh, very soon. So I'm happy to be here today talking about myths. And to start off today, I looked up the definition of what a myth is. And so some of uh, the wording around that definition is a widely held but false belief, a misrepresentation of truth, a fictitious, exaggerated, or idealized concept of a person or thing. And science is really the natural enemy of myths. Science is the systematic search for observable, measurable truth. And that is what we hope to bring you today. So let's just get started right off the bat with confronting a few myths to set the stage for this vaccine discussion. COVID-19 struck us, was declared an uh, international pandemic on March 11th, 2020. And as I come to you today on March 31st, um, there are still those who consider COVID a hoax. We hear that word hoax thrown around. And my question to you is, this a, do, does this sound like a hoax to you? Since March 11th, one American death on average every minute. An entire year has been knocked off of our life expectancy as Americans and actually disproportionately higher numbers in our black and brown populations, two to three years for, for that population. We're approaching three million confirmed deaths worldwide and probably many more that are unconfirmed or um, have not been uh, tallied as COVID deaths. This is not a hoax. I've heard people say, as we went from hundreds of deaths to thousands to tens of thousands, and now to over half a million deaths, yeah, but thousands of people die every day. The, those numbers aren't that impressive. And I would challenge you with uh, our, our death numbers over the last year and the cause of death. Um, I'm looking at data here from February 1st to January 2nd. This is the most recent data I could find. Um, 
showing deaths by cause. And we see here heart disease and cancer as the number one and number two causes of death in the United States as they, as they have been for, for decades. COVID-19 coming in at number three, the third leading cause of death last year. And this doesn't even count January of 2021, February of 2021, where we saw another at least 200,000 deaths, where probably COVID-19 closed the gap a little bit on cancer and heart disease as causes of death. This is not a hoax. I've heard people say, what's the big deal? The mortality rate is maybe only 1% for people who get COVID. And I wanna show you what that looks like uh, laid on top of, of, of all deaths in the United States. So this data is looking at average weekly number of deaths in the United States going all the way back to 2017. This yellow line is really like the average. You can see that in most years, there's a pretty nice natural cycle of numbers of death peaking in the winter time for a number of reasons. Anything above this yellow line where we see these little red pluses here that I'm spooling with my cursor is death above expected. So in 2017 to 2018, we had a pretty wicked flu outbreak, caused our number of deaths to rise above expected pretty substantially. Now look at 2020 through 2021. We see here at our peak points, which unfortunately we reached twice, last spring and this past winter, 40% higher deaths than we would expect in a normal year. This is not a hoax. I've heard people say, eh, if you're a young person, what's the big deal? COVID really only kills the elderly or people who are already quite sick. And when we look at deaths in 2020 by age group, we see this is simply not the case. We see here, if you look, use this dotted line as, as the average number of deaths in a particular age group, we see just about every age group saw at least uh, for parts of the year over 20% higher uh, number of deaths than we would expect in a normal year. Really only very young people below the age of 25 uh, saw deaths below expected because of less traffic accidents due to, the, due to shutdown. So our objectives for today are to talk a little bit, I'm gonna set the stage uh, for, for Angelo's, the second half of the presentation talking about vaccine myths by giving you a little bit of a crash course in virology. What is a virus? What is a vaccine and how do we know they're safe? What do we know about the main COVID vaccines that are available now? And then um, Angelo is gonna talk about common myths related to these vaccines and how they threaten our hope hopeful recovery from this pandemic. So let's start with the most basic question that we can. What is a virus? And I'll go a little more specifically, what is a coronavirus? Coronaviruses, is a big family, a couple hundred known coronaviruses and probably many more that we don't know about. At least seven kinds of coronavirus can infect humans. And for four of those seven known coronavirus types, they cause common colds, upper respiratory infection, they're unpleasant, they're generally not serious. In fact, about 20% of, of common colds are caused by these four types of coronaviruses. But just since the turn of the century, we've had three now epidemics, meaning unex unexpected outbreaks of different types of coronaviruses that were much more serious. In 2002 to 2003, uh, the outbreak of the first SARS, SARS meaning Sudden Acute Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus one, causing um, deaths in China and Southeast Asia, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, causing deaths in the Middle East, and then of course, in 2019 to where we stand today, the second SARS coronavirus outbreak. We look at this picture of a coronavirus here that you've seen probably stamped almost on every website related to coronavirus. Let's look a little bit about what makes up a virus because I think we need to understand that to understand how a vaccine works. When we look at a coronavirus, we see here a couple of things. Starting in the middle here, some genetic information. This is not DNA which is our long-term genetic information. This is RNA, chemically a close cousin of DNA. Then we see here a, a bubble of lipid membrane. This is actually why coronaviruses can be destroyed pretty easily with alcohol and alcohol-based hand sanitizers because it dissolves this membrane away. And then on the very outside, these spike proteins. 
These spike proteins are how coronavirus interact and infect our cells. Overall, viruses are very simple structures. They're not as complex as a living cell. They're not considered living things because they cannot reproduce on their own. So let's answer another basic question of virology. What does it mean to be infected? In order for a virus to thrive, it has to infect a cell and hijack it and use the machinery of a living cell to do its work. So we see here this coronavirus um, and the spike protein here looking for a receptor on one of our cells. This receptor is sort of like uh, a keyhole and the spike protein on the outside is like a key that is looking for its match. Unfortunately for us, coronavirus 2 spikes look for a receptor that's present on many of our cells called ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Once it finds this keyhole and binds, it can then move into our cells and trick our cells into making many new copies of itself. In fact, for the most part, this, this cell that's been infected is doing nothing more now than being a factory to make new virus. And then those new viruses can be released from the host cell and go on and infect new cells. And this will continue till our immune system um, defeats the infection, finds a way to stop these viruses from infecting more cells, um, or unfortunately death happens. Let's take a very quick crash course in the immune response. Okay, so we're not gonna cover every aspect of the immune response here, but let's talk about the most effective and most amazing part of the immune system, which is our adaptive immune system, led by our T cells and our B cells, our primary warriors against infection. And if we look at this graph here, this is looking at the immune response over time in days. And we're looking at what happens to our immune response when we're exposed to something new. Like the person next to you sneezes and you breathe in some virus, and uh, it's a virus you've never had before. What happens? Why do you get sick? And how does your immune system learn how to fight that infection? Well, there's an, there's an early phase that happens almost as soon as you're exposed to a new pathogen called the recognition phase. It takes our body a little while to recognize something as a foreign invader. And then a whole bunch of cellular processes happen in the clonal expansion and activation phase you're taking anatomy or microbiology classes, you learn much more about this. And it takes a good four to seven days before we start seeing these cells actually start to kick some butt. And so we see here during this initial phase of infection, oftentimes the virus is winning for a while. And this is when you're symptomatic. This is when you feel sick. Over time, your immune system learns how to fight this infection. It's really good at it and your immune system slowly starts to fall away as it's won the battle and you start to feel better. But importantly, during this process, you develop memory cells so that next time you're exposed to this same invader, you already know the solution to this problem. You already know how to defeat the immune response, or how to defeat the infection, I'm sorry. So we can see this when we look at a person's immune response, the first time they're exposed to a disease causing uh, agent, we call that the primary immune response, we see here a, a slower and less, uh, less strong immune response. But the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth time that a person's exposed to the same antigen, the immune response is much faster, much larger, and much longer lasting. That is all to do with these memory cells that are leading a second or a third or a hundredth uh, defense against an invader. Why does this, what does this have to do with vaccination? Well, the idea of vaccination is to purposely expose your body the first time to a new antigen or a new invader in a weakened or dead form that can't possibly cause infection. In other words, you're giving that first exposure to your body on purpose in a controlled fashion, a safe way, so that your body can make some memory cells and make some antibodies. And the first time that you're exposed to the real thing, you are already trained with how to fight off that infection. And do vaccines work? You betcha. We've got hard data here. These numbers are actually from, uh, from a Canadian website, so the numbers themselves are a little bit lower um, than 
uh, the numbers in the United States just due to population differences. But look at the percentage decrease that we see in some of these common childhood infections from before mask vaccination to after vaccination. We see 9,900% sometimes, a little bit lower with whooping cough um, for various reasons, but still 87% decrease in cases after vaccination. We've actually eradicated smallpox from the planet through vaccination, through mass vaccination. The idea of mass vaccination is to induce what we hear about all the time on the news now called herd immunity, which is that magical threshold at which it's really hard for a virus or, or any disease causing agent to keep circulating. It's, a, it's an amount of population immunity that traps the virus uh, and, and makes it very hard for the virus to spread to new unprotected people. We can use the visual here to imagine this. This is, these circles represent 100 people. And in this color-coded view here, the green circles represent individuals who are immune, yellow represent individuals who have yet to become immune, and red individuals reflect uh, people who are currently infected. The idea of herd immunity is to achieve a, a, a number of immune individuals that makes it really, really unlikely that infected individuals will come in contact with, with uh, unimmunized or not immune individuals. That means that the virus in this, in this one red individual here, this one infected person is sort of at a dead end. It has nowhere to go after this person recovers or in some cases passes away. This is achieved at roughly 80 to 85% immunity for many diseases. That is if 80 to 85% of the population is immune, vaccination or through uh, natural immunity, actually getting the infection, when we reach that magical threshold of about 85%, it becomes really, really hard for the virus to keep circulating. Now, we could have achieved herd immunity conceivably, uh, theoretically, I should say, but I don't know for sure that we could have, but theoretically, we could have achieved herd immunity with COVID-19 by letting it sweep through our population uncontrolled. Without mask mandates, without um, shutdowns, without uh, social distancing, we could have just let COVID-19 do its thing. And mathematical estimates are that at least 2.2 million people would have died in the United States. That's actually a really low number because that's probably just the number of people who would have died of COVID. Um, and probably many more people in the hundreds of thousands would have died of other causes because if we had let COVID-19 run uncontrolled through our country, our healthcare system would have absolutely collapsed. We would not have been able to treat cancer patients, pregnant mothers, uh, heart, heart patients, really anybody for a period of time. So I think this, it's conceivable that this number is, is pretty, pretty low ball actually. There's urgency now for us to achieve herd immunity as fast as possible because viruses mutate, viruses change. And if we allow COVID-19 to circulate and continue to mutate, um, it's possible that the mutations that that virus takes will make um, those who are currently immune from either vaccination or infection no longer protected. In other words, a virus will change enough that we'll go back to square one. We'll start over at 0% immunity if we have this, these mutation events occur. The best way for us to stop this pandemic in its tracks is to reach herd immunity quickly before those, those uh, really dangerous mutations occur. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, the vaccination process for COVID-19. You might have heard of Operation Warp Speed, which was a, a government effort to really speed up, to expedite the production of co or the creation of COVID-19 uh, vaccinations. And I love the quote here, it's expedite but not rush. There's a difference between the approach that was taken and rushing through and doing things uh, irresponsibly. So the idea of Operation Warp Speed was to put all of our resources together, company, uh, government, public uh, entities, private company resources, Let's everybody work together, even when sometimes when we're competing companies, let's just stop competing right now and work together. 
combining efforts, cutting uh, regulatory red tape wherever it was possible, uh, maintaining safety standards. So one of the things I want you to take away from this slide is that the FDA, who's in charge of approving vaccinations, did not skip any steps here. Yes, the, the time frame was shortened for many of these steps, but not a single step was skipped. That's not true in some parts of the world. The vaccinations that are currently being given, and I'm happy to say they're, they're being given at incredible rates now, they went through the same three-phase clinical trial system that all vaccinations go through, including a double-blind phase three trial with at least 30,000 participants. The FDA said right away, don't even come to us until you've got this done for approval. We, they, FDA said we need to see safety data for at least two months after the last vaccination is given because Every adverse reaction known uh, for previous vaccines happened well before the two month time. Point. So they just wanted, they picked two months because it was far out um, past the point where previous, uh, previous side effects had happened. And they said, don't even come to us unless your vaccine is minimum 50% effective in preventing symptomatic disease. Turns out so far, all the vaccines that are on the market are much, much higher than 50%. You can see here a visual of the normal preclinical process, which happens in some animal models, and then the, the three-phase human trial system, phase one, phase two, phase three. We'll go through the exact details of all of this, and then phase four is, is where it's available to, uh, to the, the masses. A typical process for developing a vaccine might take 10 to 20 years. All steps were followed in the development of COVID-19 vaccinations, but we got it done in about a year and a couple months. The types of COVID vaccines that are available uh, right now, at least on the market, fit into two groups, the mRNA vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer. And, um, and let's talk about those really quickly, just so you can understand what they are. Um, mRNA vaccines, despite what you might hear, are not new technology. They've been around for decades. The reason that they haven't gone into mass production is because there are some practical challenges with keeping them effective in cold storage that you might have heard about on the news, but not because they're not safe and not because they're not effective. In fact, Moderna, for example, has nine other mRNA vaccines that probably will be out on the market very soon, uh, along with their COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. So the idea of an mRNA vaccine is to take a small chunk, not the whole viral uh, genetic code, but a small chunk and basically uh, package it up into a lipid bubble and inject it into a person. And that small amount of mRNA can then guide our cells to make the, just the spike protein, not the entire virus. You cannot get virus from this vac vaccine, but your body can make enough of the spike protein that you'll train your immune system what to look for if the real COVID-19 virus is introduced to your body. The efficacy of these vaccines is, is off the charts, a 95%, 94.5%, um, slight, slight differences between the two products. Um, all of them, again, went through phase three trials with over 30,000 people. Many of them, or both of them, have now been injected into tens of millions of people with astonishingly high safety uh, safety profile. The Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccines use a different technology, also not a new technology, uh, using a very weakened adenovirus, which is a, a virus that causes common cold, and again, introducing just a little bit, a small piece of the, MR, of the RNA of the uh, vaccine genetic material into our body to train our to train ourselves um, and expose our immune system, know what to look for if COVID-19 is introduced. Practical advantage of, of this one, they, uh, at least the J Johnson & Johnson vaccine is only one dose. That's enough to induce a strong immune response. And uh, storage temperatures are, are not quite as difficult. A regular refrigerator is able to store the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for quite some time. So there's some practical advantages to this technology that the mRNA vaccines don't offer. Despite what you might have heard, the Johnson Johnson vaccine is also uh, incredibly effective. It has a slightly lower uh, percentage efficacy against infection, 
of 72% system of systemic infection compared to those uh, mRNA vaccines that got the big splash with 95% efficacy, but at least 85% effective against severe disease and 100% effective uh, against death. So still really, really effective products. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Angelo to talk about some of the myths related to these and other vaccines so that you are prepared to go out into the world and help others see the truth and dispel these myths. Thanks, Matt. And I didn't see any questions um, in the chat specifically about stuff that you didn't address. So that is great. You covered a lot of great topics. Um, but now I'm going to take over and start sharing my screen, if I may, and start talking through uh, the myths that we've been finding um, all throughout the news. And I, I really, really like looking into the basis of these myths. What, what in the world happened? Where do these myths come from? Uh, and we have some pretty practical ones just based on societal misunderstanding. And then we have some really far out ones like microchips and 5G and things like that. And so again, that's going to be uh, monitoring the chat. I'll stop me in my tracks if I uh, don't uh, address a question. Um, so the first myth that we're going to address um, is the, the big one. Lots of people who have been paying attention to the news um, think that these aren't safe, they're not effective because they didn't go through normal clinical testing. And that's not true. If we look at the, the history real quick, right? We actually had a head start on this. We've had previous coronavirus outbreaks um, with SARS and MERS. And uh, with those two viruses, they had a high enough death rate that they were kind of uh, self-defeating. If you kill too many humans before you can replicate in more humans, then you're not gonna spread that well. And so while those vaccines got started in development, the funding kind of fell, uh, fell away because there wasn't any more of that virus. It kind of just uh, defeated itself. Whereas with coronaviruses, right, this COVID-19 thing that we're going through, since it's the same type of virus, we already had uh, types of vaccines to start with, over 240 different vaccine candidates. And so uh, the reason that many uh, trials take time it's not because you know there's there's a minimum amount of time that you must test things in. It's because of the money it costs to bring things to trial, and so many governments around the world decided, okay, pharmaceutical companies, if we take care of the money part, right? So you don't risk any of your own money testing something that might fail. Um, well, you still do it, and they agreed. And so we started out with 240, and this is kind of this list that goes down, and 40 made it to clinical trials level one, right? And so this is where a lot of governments started making some bets. We're going to pre-purchase these vaccines before they're actually approved, just in case we have the correct bet, right? And this is this is pretty risky with money if you think about it, right? Because only about 27 of those moved into phase two trials. Of those, 20 made it into uh, phase three trial, and then three so far have made it through emergency use authorization. So this kind of tells you that we are going through a lot of really stringent testing, the same testing that we would go through, but we're doing these trials at the same time. And you're only hearing about the ones that actually pass on the news with all the testing. And again, the FDA has some of the strictest standards in the world. And so again, this isn't even the fastest we've ever done things. If we look at all the pandemics that we've had since the turn of the 20th century, right? Uh, this has been com uh, compared to Spanish flu a whole lot. They had a death toll of 40 to 50 million. And when we looked at how long it took to get that vaccine, that was about 25 years. But we have a lot more um, since then experience with flu. So the next flu pandemic that we had that ended up killing 1.1 million uh, that started in February, it only took five months for us to figure that out because we had previous experience. Same thing with Hong Kong flu. And then we had this first SARS outbreak in 2003 and that killed 774 people. Now, after those people died about a 
a year later, the funding was cut off for the development of that vaccine. So that one never uh, got further developed. Uh, same thing with the MERS vaccine, the Ebola vaccine, right? We've all kind of remember that big Ebola outbreak that we had um, in the uh, 2017, I think it was, uh, where we were very uh, much concerned about how far Ebola was spreading. And so we had started on the Ebola vaccine the first time we found Ebola really going throughout Africa. But since it didn't you know, travel outside of Africa, a lot of world governments didn't find it prudent to make a vaccine until um, the big outbreak that started spreading other places. Um, and so again, this coronavirus vaccine development even isn't even our world record in vaccine speed. We've had lots of pandemics where we've learned from our previous pandemics. Now, the next claim that I want to address is that this vaccine is going to somehow genetically modify me, right? We're using some mRNA, which is an instruction code, right? And it's very related to DNA, but it's not DNA. DNA is our in instruction code. And what happens with this virus, right, is the um, virus, we can take a little piece of its genes, not even its whole genes, just the gene that is responsible for making that all-important spike protein, the protein that helps it attach to cells. And so the vaccine delivers that into our cells our cells make those spike proteins. Notice it doesn't even interact with our nucleus, which contains our DNA. So there's no basis in reality that this is gonna genetically modify humans. It doesn't even interact with their nucleus. Even if it could, it does not have any ability to modify your DNA. And so it's just plain false that you can modify humans. And I finally looked into where this myth came from and it came from somebody by the name of Dr. Andrew Kaufman, who is a natural healing consultant during an interview on a YouTube channel. And so this kind of just talks about the role of social media and the spread of misinformation. You can either listen to experts or somebody on YouTube saying that the um, vaccine is gonna genetically modify you through something called electroporation, which pokes holes in your cells or something like that. It's total BS, it's not real, okay? So again, it will not alter your DNA in any way, shape, or form. Nor can you get COVID from the actual COVID vaccine because it doesn't contain the entire virus. It contains a little tiny piece of the virus, enough of the virus for your immune cells to say, hey, this is what we're looking at. And so if, if you can kind of think about it like a most wanted poster, right? Hey guys, anything that has the spike protein on it, we're gonna gobble up and eat. And so here is this bandit virus, the coronavirus, marked with the spike proteins, and here are your immune cells going to catch it and capture it and kill it, right? That's what we're doing in essence. We want your immune system to know what to look for upon it entering so your immune system already knows how to kill it as soon as it enters. You don't even have to think about it. You won't get sick. The vaccine will warn your body what this looks like. So if it ever appears in your body, it's captured and killed automatically. And that's the whole point of the vaccine. So you won't get coronavirus from the vaccine. It won't alter your DNA because it's not even made out of DNA. Now. There's also another uh, myth that the ingredients in vaccines are dangerous. Um, and that's just not true from, from multiple perspectives. When we look at the ingredients in a vaccine, right, the main ingredient is water. You are also made mainly out of water. The active ingredient is a small harmless amount of some piece of a pathogen, right? If you want to uh, immunize yourself against whooping cough, it takes the little tail part of the bacteria, right? Which is not dangerous. Um, some of them will con contain some preservatives and stabilizers. Um, sorbitol um, that is naturally found in fruit 
is a good preservative to keep the vaccines from going bad when you um, take them out of the freezer and warm them up. Um, there might be some adjuvants in them. Adjuvants are uh, salts mainly that are used to help the immune response. Whenever you get a shot in your arm, for instance, you might notice that it hurts for a few days. That's because what the vaccine is trying to do is stay concentrated in that area. And the reason that you want to have it concentrated in that area is that your body is tricked into thinking, oh my God, there's a huge amount of virus or bacteria attacking the body. We better go and do something about it. Whereas if it got into your blood or spread throughout the rest of your body, well, then there's not enough of it for it to think that there's an issue. And so again, the ingredients have all been tested for safety. Now, when we look at the COVID vaccine, the mRNA vaccines, the actual ingredients include some mRNA, that's the little instruction code for the virus, and some lipids. Lipids are little fats and oils. Now, to kind of understand this, how it protects with a, a little bubble, I want you to think about a lava lamp. Right? You might have seen lava lamps where those little balls go up and down, right? And it turns out your cells are also covered in lipids. And so notice what happens when those two lipids come together. Well, most time they combine. And so this allows you to deliver the mRNA in this protective little bubble into your cells. And that allows it to absorb into your body and then it can dissolve and that's it. So it contains some sodium chloride, right? You might've sprinkled that on your McDonald's French fries today. Um, there is some potassium chloride, which is the same stuff that you have in some IV fluid. Uh, potassium uh, potassium uh, uh, phosphate, which you get in some Gatorade. Um, and then some uh, stuff like a dibasic sodium phosphate, which is found in cream of wheat and jello and things like that. These are all basic things that we've always put into our bodies with no real problem. And so it's really safe. It's nice and highly purified. Um, there is no mercury, contrary to popular belief, some people believe that vaccines have mercury. Um, it doesn't have any aluminum. It doesn't have fetal tissue, right? Fetal tissue wouldn't even fit through the syringe. And some people believe that these have microchips um, and microchips are pretty big. That would also not fit through the syringe. Um, so again, it doesn't have any of those really spooky sounding ingredients, right? So again, you're trying to have the body take a look at what the spike protein looks like so it knows what to target. Anything that has this spike protein, like a virus, we're going to attack, okay? And so it doesn't give you COVID-19, doesn't give you Bell's palsy. It also doesn't cause female fertility or infertility. Um, and that's, that's something that we're also gonna address a little bit later. Now, there's also a myth that, hey, I've been infected, I recovered, I can throw off that mask, I'm really good, I'm immune, I'm ready to go. But it turns out that we've been doing some studies on that question, right? Because there's what we call natural immunity, where if you get sick with the disease, usually you get immune from that. However, that's not true for all diseases. And if you've noticed anything about colds, right? You might get colds multiple times a year, every year. That's because coronaviruses by definition typically don't give you natural immunity. That's how they survive seasonally. And so we've actually measured through studies how much immunity getting COVID-19 actually gives you. And it looks like it's somewhere between 60 to 80% effective at preventing reinfection for maybe up to five months. And that's being very generous with that. But it also does not stop transmission. So you can get coronavirus, have some immunity to it, but you can still spread it to others. Where in the vaccine, that is not true. Not only does it protect you, in our mRNA vaccines, up to 95% from actually getting disease, it also stops the transmission of disease. And that's not too surprising to many scientists because we've known that there's multiple diseases that you can get, right, that have 
pretty bad immunity, where the immunity from the vaccine is actually better than the immunity by actually getting the actual virus. That's true for uh, the HPV vaccine. It's much more protective than actually getting the virus. The tetanus vaccine, the haemophilus influenzae, the pneumococcal vaccines, all of these have much, much better immunity than what we um, see for natural infections. And so this is why the CDC says, hey, even if you got uh, COVID-19, right, that is not as protective as the actual vaccine. So go ahead and get the vaccine. And you'll notice that lots of uh, these mRNA vaccines have two doses, right? The COVID-19 act as your first kind of dose, if you will, and then you're going to get the COVID-19 vaccine, and that's going to really boost that immunity to make that 95% and add that transmission protection. Now, there's another myth that still won't go away with vaccines and autism. Lots of people believe that, for some reason, vaccines cause autism, but it turns out that is absolutely 100% false. Where this story comes from was from a 1998 paper uh, by a doctor, a former doctor by the name of Andrew Wakefield. And Andrew Wakefield was comparing two groups of children, a very, very small ch uh, study about 11 or 12 children. And he compared children who were perfectly healthy but unvaccinated with those that were autistic, but fully vaccinated. And he didn't use controls to compare them. So he had no control group, couldn't run any statistics, and he relied on parents' memory as to when autism occurred versus when they were vaccinated. And so somehow in his paper, he writes that somehow the MMR vaccine, which is a viral vaccine, caused the bacteria in the gut to change. And somehow that change of bacteria in the gut led to problems with neurological development. And so he publishes this and um, it turns out after that publication, the world freaked out. There were headlines all over the world. A study finds potential link between autism and vaccination. But to many scientists at the time, that didn't make sense because if vaccines caused autism, guess how many people in the US and in the world would have autism? The vast majority. And so we started looking into this. In 99, we did studies with children and vaccines, 500 uh, children, couldn't find any connection. 2001 couldn't find any connection in 10,000 children, 530,000 children, 535,000 children, 10 million children, 14 million children. After studying 14 million children as a planet, we did these studies all over planet Earth, spent $3 trillion on this one question, zero cases of autism. And so we started asking some questions. We went to them and said, hey, uh, can we can we have some of your samples to test? Oh, I, I lost those. Do you have any records so we can go back to these children to, to test them directly? Oh, nope, I lost those as well. And so finally, through some investigation, it was found that he falsified these studies. He falsified these studies. He lost his medical license. He can no longer publish in any scientific journal, but it turns out that that seed still remains in parents' heads. A quarter of all parents still believe that vaccines cause autism, right? And so that has led to some parents opting out of all vaccines. And so, of course, what happens when you don't have a population that's vaccinated is you start to see cases of vaccine-preventable diseases taken off. Right, we're, we're seeing huge amounts of whooping cough cases across the United States. Measles, of all things, considered eradicated from the United States in 2001, right, was at the most magical place on earth recently. 
And so this sort of thought process, these, these myths that we have that spread very well in popular media cause reductions in people getting vaccinated and that increases the amount of disease and death through vaccine refusal. Now, another uh, potential uh, myth is that vaccines, the COVID vaccine somehow affects a woman's fertility. Um, and this is based off of um, some viral posts that some um, person put together saying, stop the COVID vaccine studies. Um, this is a Facebook and YouTube thing again um, that said that, hey, people who participated in the vaccine trial of Pfizer um, lost their babies. It affected pregnancy. Um, but when we actually looked at the vaccine trial during the Pfizer vaccine, 23 women volunteers during the study became pregnant and only one lost their pregnancy in the placebo group in the placebo group who didn't receive the vaccine. And so it's absolutely false that COVID actually affects a woman's fertility, right? And uh, most experts agree, right? If you go to your doctor, your doctor is going to say if you're pregnant that you should most likely consider the vaccine because if you look at the risk of pregnant women actually getting COVID-19, right? The mater and so those, that's the red dots here. Right? So here are pregnant women that get COVID vac uh, vaccines some, uh, or COVID um, actual disease. Some of them die of COVID. Some of them are admitted to uh, intensive care units. Some have preterm birth. Um, and then a lot of them get admitted to the neonatal unit, right? And so there's great risk for pregnancy for actually getting the infection. Right? And so this is why most experts agree that pregnant women should and will get vaccinated. Now, then there's a far out there myth, right? That some 5G mobile internet networks are causing the spread of COVID-19. And people argue online that because we're building 5G towers, and because COVID is increasing during that time, that somehow that's connected. But that's kind of like saying, hey, baby Yoda came to us in 2019 as well. He must be spreading COVID-19. But lots of people believe this. And so in the UK, 77 mobile towers were burnt to the ground because they thought that they caused the spread of COVID-19 through 5G waves. Not impossible. Um, and again, this really, really spreads very quickly online because people don't understand the difference between correlation and causation. Correlation means two events happen together. Yes, in 2019, uh, 2019 COVID hit and baby Yoda hit. That does not mean that one causes the other. Now, Another way out there one is that there's going to be microchips to put in there by um, this guy, um, Bill Gates, to track you, which is very interesting if you think about it, because if you are anything like me, I carry my phone with me all the time, and this is currently tracking us. You're on a device right now watching me that can also track you. There's no need to put microchips in vaccines, but that was actually not a thing. Again, this comes from a conspiracy theorist on YouTube from a interview with Bill Gates who wanted to develop technology to put microchips, scannable little microchips on the syringes that are used to give the vaccine to tell whether or not they were expired because there was lots of concern, right? If you um, ship things and it's not in a deep freeze, they might expire. You don't want to give somebody an expired vaccine. That's where that came from, but then it changed into there's injectable microchips, which is a technology, by the way, that doesn't exist right now. Okay. Now, then there's the, well, if I'm completely vaccinated or I'm completely immune, I have no reason anymore to wear a mask or social distance. 
And it turns out that's not true. Right? This is because there's still some sort of risk, albeit small, of spreading disease. And it turns out we haven't reached what we call herd immunity, which is estimated to be right around that 80% mark. Here's the kind of marks of herd immunity. This is the amount of people that need to be vaccinated in order for the disease to go away, right? So what we've measured is that that has to be around 82.5% of the population vaccinated. And we're not there yet. We could be there. And that's when we can really start to reduce our public health initiatives. However, right now is not the time because we have not reached herd immunity. Now, we're doing a pretty good job. I have some data that I would like to show you from directly from the CDC website that shows us the amount of people that are um, on a daily basis who are being vaccinated, right? And so we're almost to the average of 1 million people vaccinated a day, which is really good in a population of 333 million. Now, the total um, people who are fully vaccinated were, ra were racing to this, right? So total dose that is administered, um, this is all on the CDC website, the amount of people at least having one dose, right, their daily count. We can also look at the cumulative count, right? So we're right around 55 million people that have received both doses of the vaccine in the US. So we're, we're making pretty good progress, but public health officials are kind of worried because, right, we have to get to this 80% number for herd immunity. And right now we're making pretty good progress for the percent of population that is getting vaccinated. So this is infections versus vaccinations, right? But According to current polling, about a third of, of Americans, a third to about a quarter of Americans are still saying that they're probably not gonna get vaccinated, which would put us at most at 75%, which is far below that number that we need to be at. And that becomes a problem because if we don't vaccinate quick enough, Right? and people are refusing vaccines on purpose for whatever myth-related reason that we have, we won't reach herd immunity. Right? If we don't reach herd immunity, that gives the virus more options, more ability, more host to mutate in. And so then we go back to square one. And I get it, we're all tired. Of coronavirus. We're all tired of having to wear masks. We're all tired of hearing it every day. We're all tired of coronavirus. But guess who is not tired? The virus itself. It can outlast you pretty well. But as humans, we've caused these diseases to almost go extinct, right? We even stopped vaccinating against smallpox in the 1970s, right? You probably haven't heard of diphtheria cases, right? Polio, you haven't worried about since the 60s, right? We've taken care of a lot of these diseases through vaccination programs because previous generations of us thought that it was important that, hey, that neighbor that I have over there who are, who's dead or dying, that person that left uh, is, is no longer able to live in their home because their uh, the breadwinner of the family died, right? They thought that that was important enough. Their fellow man was important enough to do something about disease. We have to consider herd immunity to be important. We just can't worry about ourselves anymore. Herd immunity is really important. And we have to all care about it equally. Yes, we can protect ourselves with vaccines, but those vaccines that we're protecting ourselves against are useless unless our population gets it because of the possibility of mutation. 
So I'm hoping that you guys take away from this talk some of the common myths that people believe in still to this day and how they're not true and how you can show that with scientific evidence. And that might help break down some of that 33% or 25% of people who say that they're gonna refuse vaccines so we can get to this magic number and hopefully return to what is considered normal. Because if we don't and we don't get ahead of this fast enough, we just throw off our mask and say, that's it, I'm done with coronavirus, it's not gonna be done with us. And with that, I'll take any questions. Angelo, I um, <clears throat> I have to admit, I fell a little bit behind right at the end. We got a, a flood of some really good questions. So I'm gonna do a lightning round and throw a couple at you, okay? Okay, sure. All right, we have a really good question. You talked about uh, a myth related to the COVID vaccine and female fertility. Yes. Um, one of our one of our listeners asked about a similar myth she had heard about male fertility. Can you address that? Yeah, so that had to do with um, some COVID uh, RNA being detected in the testes um, and how some people thought it could be spread sexually. That was found to be incorrect. There's no data that live virus can actually uh, replicate in the testes and then spread in the testes, but it had nothing to do with fertility. It was just this one study that found that there was COVID RNA present and that might um, be uh, excreted in the um, semen. Thanks. Here's, a, here's another one. Um, is it a, a myth or a fact that hospitals or other facilities were lying about the cause of death in patients to get COVID funding yeah, and thereby so. skewing the death rate numbers? Yeah, totally a myth um, because, and it was a myth that somehow they got money for this. No, they got an infusion of money well before they were treating patients. And it turns out that it cost a lot of money to put somebody on a ventilator. And so, what the government said and the um, uh, insurance agency said was, okay, just do all you can to treat these COVID patients, right? Um, but there's there's no compensation for a COVID death, right? You get compensated for trying to keep that person alive, not for death. For death certificates, those the cause of death is put on by the doctor. The doctor doesn't get directly paid for death certificates. It, it just doesn't make sense. And so again, there's no compensation or there's no reason for doctors to inflate the numbers. Um, a couple of clarifications. Um, the 55 million folks that you showed who are fully vaccinated, those are 55 million in the United States. Not, yes. not the world. Correct. Um, the question in the herd immunity percentage, would people who have had COVID-19 but not been vaccinated, would they be included? Um, yeah. Yep. And that's part of the CDC estimate that I was showing with my last slide, how the infections are counting towards that herd immunity threshold, right? But the problem is, is that that, that number of infections is going to go down as vaccines go up. But the other thing is, is that that immunity falls up much faster with the natural infection. And so this is a very dynamic process, right? Because as you increase the amount of vaccinations and the amount of infections go down, so does the natural immunity. So the overall herd immunity, those numbers adding together are also going to go down over time. And so that's why it's so important that we reach those herd immunity levels with vaccination programs. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question that's in the chat and then um, and then I'll stop talking for a little while and let people who haven't put a question in the chat jump in if they would like. Um, a couple of folks asked a similar question. Can you explain a little bit or talk a little bit about why the, the immunity gained through vaccination might possibly be more effective than that gained through natural infection? Yeah, there's lots of reasons. The most uh, pressing reason is that you can trick the immune system into thinking that there's more 
antigen or virus there than in a natural infection, right? So if we think about our uh, immune system and how we get cold seasonally, right? Cold caused by coronaviruses, right? Uh, your body is used to thinking, okay, coronaviruses, colds, no big deal, right? It doesn't cause death usually, things like that. And so since your body is used to not having immunity to colds, the immunity that you do build up wanes very quickly. However, if you take some sort of uh, vaccine like a spike protein and you put a huge amount or relative huge amount in a very localized space, it's like the, the tanks are coming over the wall. Oh my gosh, there's a huge amount of this unknown thing, right? Because it's just a spike protein. Your, your immune system doesn't know any better. There's this huge thing that looks scary. And so whenever your body sees a really, really high amount of something that looks scary, it's going to generate a lot more of those memory cells than for a natural infection where it sees a virus that doesn't kill you. And so that's why we believe that the immunity for natural infections tends to fall off much quicker and it doesn't prevent the spread. Whereas with the vaccine, you can make this artificial environment that tricks your immune system into thinking it's a big deal. Would anybody like to jump in with a question they haven't put in the chat? I'm, I'll keep I'll keep looking at the chat as well, um, and I'm typing a few answers as we speak. But um, love to give people a chance to unmute and ask a question too. Yeah, I'm I'm seeing a couple of uh, things in the private chat. Um, is there a date in mind that we have for um, herd immunity that we need to have that by? There's no date. The reason that the CDC director said that there's some impending doom on the way is because uh, certain states, uh, municipalities, things like that, are getting rid of the other public health interventions before we've reached herd immunity. We're hoping, or it was to hope that we have the vast majority of adults vaccinated by the beginning to midsummer. Um, there was just a study put out by Pfizer today, I was just looking at this earlier, that says that their vaccine is 99.8% effective in children uh, from between the ages of uh, 8 and uh, 16. And so that's, that's really good news, and we're hoping to have children vaccinated um, by the start of school. So we're hoping that we can get it fast enough. The problem is, is that as states start to reopen and we're thinking, oh, okay, they're low enough, we can get on with their lives. That's exactly the recipe for the virus to mutate. And if the virus mutates enough, the vaccines become less and less effective and then we mean more and more herd immunity and it's just this counteraction that we can't have right now. Yeah, how long should you wait to get the vaccine after recovering from being infected and why? And so that is a conversation with your doctor because recovered is still a variable term, right? Because we have had people who have lingering symptoms, these long haulers, and we're not exactly 100%, we're, we're, that, that data is becoming much more clearer, but these long haulers are having these progressive symptoms and it seems as though they still have the virus in them. And what, has, what studies have been done about this have shown that after the first and second dose of the vaccine, those long haulers get better all of a sudden for reasons, of course, that we're still trying to figure out. And so you want to figure out exactly what signs and symptoms that you have and then have tests done to figure out is the virus still there? Is it, is it not there? And then have the vaccine based on the amount of uh, antibodies that you currently have or don't have. And so they'll, they'll do some testing on you to see whether or not your body is ready to get the vaccine. Um, uh, I'll just quick, yeah. quickly jump in and say, um, a couple of folks have asked if the, the recording is gonna be shared on YouTube um, and, uh, 
I think we're going to try to get the link out via science instructors and via student involvement. And Heidi, Thomas just posted it'll be on the NWTC too in time. Is that a is that an, a YouTube channel, Heidi? Okay, she says yes. NWTC two. Okay, I'm sorry I interrupted somebody who asking a question. Oh, that it's it's all good. Let's see. Um, so, any idea when the vaccine might be approved for children under 12? Uh, Pfizer said that they're going with the data from the study today to the FDA today, um, and then the FDA, of course, has to do their review, make sure all their I's are dotted and their T's are crossed with the safety and things like that. Um, the uh, and then the numbers that I said from the study, the 98 effective for 8 to 16, that was 99.8. So they're saying it's effectively 100% protective against children uh, for the COVID vaccine. Um, what happens if you receive the vaccine too soon after having COVID? Um, so, two, so again, this is relative questions because once you have COVID, you're going to develop some antibodies, right? The whole point of getting the vaccine is to develop antibodies and immunity. So your doctor will want to figure out how many of the right type of antibodies that you have and whether or not you've developed good immunity from that. And then that's when the discussion of the vaccine is going to happen. And so um, there's, it's really impossible to answer what too soon actually means um, unless you have a conversation with your doctor and figure out how how long you haven't had COVID for, because th those numbers are going to matter to them. Um, why does it seem like children are not getting COVID-19 as much as other populations, even though they went to school? Or that's what people actually say. So that's a, another great question. It's not that kids are not spreading it. They are indeed spreading it. Um, there was a study that showed that um, students um, middle school age and above study it or spread it just as much as adults. They are spreading it. It's just unlikely or less likely that they display outward signs and symptoms. And so asymptomatic spread is fairly easy in children because they don't display as many signs and symptoms. So it's not that they don't get it and it's not that they're not spreading it. They are indeed spreading it. It's just very difficult to track, right? If you don't outwardly show signs and symptoms, it's very difficult to track, well, who spread what where. But yes, it definitely is spreading in school. It's just very, very troublesome to track down until the adults start getting sick. And then once the adults start getting sick, you have to backtrack. Uh, let's see. Are they... Testing vaccines for kids under eight years old. Yes, what are they? Uh, what they're doing? All these companies are doing, are doing what we call backtracking studies, right? And so once you find it really safe for those 65 and above, then you also test that for below 65. And once you've shown that's safe, then you start to go in children and pregnant women and uh, people with pre-existing uh, conditions that normally. We would want to start to see safe. And so we're backtracking and we're starting testing on children as well. Or not really starting. These trials have been going on since we've for, for a few months. It's just that they're getting results and we're backtracking, backtracking, backtracking um, to see what ones that we can start uh, releasing the vaccine for. And so that's those studies are ongoing. Um, let's see. So I can jump in um, yeah. a question about a hot topic. It's been in the news about the origin of the outbreak. Um, yeah. There there are a number of different scenarios that have been proposed for how COVID-19 could have come around. Um, there is no conclusive statement made by any scientific organization as of yet, but by far and away, the most likely scenario for where COVID came from is that it was an existing virus in an animal, in an animal, uh, probably bats or pangolins um, that either jumped right to humans from a direct contact with with that animal and human, or through an intermediate farm, like a farm animal, for example, domestic animal. That is still far and away considered the most likely 
source of COVID-19. Other less uh, natural and more nefarious uh, ideas that have been thrown out have not been disproven, but I think Angelo's statement that he made about baby Yoda causing COVID-19 because they both emerged at the same time is a really good, uh, really good reminder of why evidence is necessary to make a claim. And the, the, the absence of evidence to disprove something is not the same as the presence of evidence to prove it. So please be careful about you know, jumping to those conclusions, even though some individuals who have a microphone in front of them have lately have not been very careful about that. There is still zero evidence for uh, COVID-19 being produced on purpose or even accidentally in a lab setting, despite the fact we can't disprove it yet. Yeah, and there's also lots of evidence pointing to the origin being bats as well. Um, and epidemiologists and scientists are really, really good at getting to the bottom of things. Um, and getting evidence and things like that. And so this is how, if you've ever watched a lot of those epidemiology, like thrillers, like uh, outbreak and things like that, how we can track down patient one and things like that. We have the technology to do that. It's only a matter of time, but almost all the evidence that we've collected so far points towards bats and doesn't point towards a lab. Um, let's see, so is it fair to say the two main reasons the period of time to develop and approve the vaccines was so much shorter is because number one, phase one and two in the back preclinical trials were already done, yes, and funding from the government, yes, right? Because again, if you think about the risk in developing a product for a pharmaceutical company, right? You're you're basically making a bet. We're gonna bring this forward to testing, even though you know it might not work and it's going to cost billions of dollars, do we spend our own money to do this or not? When we have 500 potential vaccines, which one do you bring forward to test and why? If you take away the money risk, well, let's test all 500 then. There's no, there's no risk there for the pharmaceutical company. So yes, that's the whole reason that this was fast-tracked the way it was because the pharmaceutical companies did not have to bet their own money on their product working. And notice, we started with upwards of 500, we ended up with three, right? And so, uh, three so far. All the clinical testing is ongoing, but when you take away the money hurdle, things go much faster. The other thing I, I want people to, to understand, if I can jump in, Angelo, about the specifically mRNA vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, is that while it's technically true that they're new vaccines, they're really slightly different formulations of vaccines that have been around for a long time. mRNA vaccines have always had a practical challenge of how do we get them into a person's arm before they degrade because they mRNA is a very unstable molecule and, and that's why super cold storage is sometimes needed. But the big advantage of mRNA vaccines has always been that we, we felt we could develop a vaccine from scratch for a new pandemic that emerges out of nowhere, just like COVID-19 did, that, that that would be the quickest way to get us to a vaccine. So these companies like Moderna have, have been working on this technology for a long time, and we're basically ready to go uh, as, soon as, as soon as actually, you know, before we started documenting cases in, in the United States, they were already working on COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. And then, like Angelo said, the infusion of money and the partnerships that were created allowed it to go much faster. But mRNA vaccines have been around for a long time just for this particular use. Yeah, and then a, a couple more comments in the chat. Um, if I am fully vaccinated and I come uh, in contact with somebody who has a confirmed case of COVID, am I still spreading it or is my body killing it? And so I have to answer that with numbers. Um, your body is most likely killing it and you have an 80% less likelihood of being able to spread it to an individual, right? So again, 95% of the time your body's killing it for yourself so you don't have to worry about disease and 80% of the time you're not spreading it, right? 
Now, is that to say that it's impossible to spread? No, but if you're mitigating, right, you're wearing a mask, you're doing that thing, it's very, very unlikely if you're fully vaccinated that you're going to spread that to another individual, even if you came in contact with a confirmed individual. So that's the really the end of the questions. Uh, are there any other questions that I did not see um, on your end or on my end? Again, you can put it in the um, chat. You can put it in, um, you can turn on your mic if you'd like and ask a question directly. Um, there was a question about, are, is there truly evidence that's, that supports some maybe anecdotal observations or conversations that the Moderna uh, vaccine causes perhaps a stronger uh, set of unpleasant uh, immune responses than the Pfizer vaccine? Yeah, so what we're seeing um, is with, well, with both vaccines right now, the first vaccine is priming your immune system to, is basically putting up the wanted posters, right? Whereas the second vaccine, the second dose, is going to boost that initial dose. And so you're more likely with the second dose of vaccine to start feeling your immune system activate, right? Start feeling the fever, start feeling, oh my gosh, there's there's stuff coming into the arm. We're gonna get some inflammation going there, right? And you might start to feel more exhausted because your body's using energy to try to fight that off, what it thinks is a real infection. And so usually with that second primary dose or that second dose of either of those two vaccines, we're seeing these effects of fever, exhaustion, um, that pain in the arm thing. Um, and that's just your immune system activating and making those memory cells. Because again, the whole point of that is to, in other words, freak out your immune system to, to say, oh my God, we need to do something about this right now. Um, and then you'll feel some effects. That, that by the way, is not disease, that's your immune system replicating. Um, let's see, it seems that we were really unprepared for this pandemic. What changes are being made to make us more prepared for future pandemics? What can we make, what, what can we make as individuals to prepare us for future pandemics? Um, that is a really tough question to answer. I know um, we had Operation Warp Speed. We're getting back together the pandemic response team, um, things like that. But on a personal level, um, what we have walked away with or what we've seen during this pandemic is that misinformation spreads so much faster than accurate real information. And so what we can do as individuals, at least on this video call right now, is check the sources of things before we share them. And that will really, really help try to stop the spread of misinformation. Because again, the misinformation is almost as bad as a pandemic as the actual viral pandemic. It spreads just as fast as the virus. And that, of course, gets at people's emotions and it makes them make decisions based off of emotions that aren't based on reality or fact. And so if we could do something as a society to stop the spread of misinformation, just as individuals, just checking into a source before you share something that sounds kind of fishy or sensationalized and check into sources, that will do a great, great deed for society. And then uh, the reactions that we're seeing with the current vaccines, that can happen with any vaccine. That is also true. Um, the most likely side effects, I don't even call them side effects anymore, I call them the effects, is seeing a fever or inflammation or feeling some exhaustion after a vaccine. Um, let's see. Some vaccines are two shots and others are one. Uh, the difference is that the manufacturer, it is a different manufacturer and it's a different um, vaccine. All day. That's the Johnson & Johnson is the one shot one. Um, and it's a different technology. The mRNA um, is different from the 
um, type of vaccine that Johnson & Johnson makes. It's a very, uh, it's an old technology for the Johnson & Johnson one. Um, and it has some really, really practical advantages. It doesn't have to have that ultra cold storage. It can just be put in a refrigerator and then the whole one dose instead of two dose thing um, is also an, an advantage with that. Um, a question, so if I had COVID but get the test to find out the antibodies um, aren't there anymore, could it possibly still have antibodies but just fade it out? Well, that's the whole thing. If they fade it out, you're no longer protected. And so you want to make sure that if you don't have any protection that you get protected. Um, and that's, that's seeming really good right now. Um, and at least is lasting for 11 months since the first people in the first trials received the vaccine, they, they are still showing strong antibodies with those mRNA vaccines. And so uh, right now, the vaccines at least have doubled the amount of protection as the natural infection as far as length of time. Ah, boosters. Are boosters being developed just in case? Yes, they are. Because remember that spike protein that we were talking about is the protein in the virus that are getting the mutations. And so Pfizer, uh, Moderna are already developing alternative spikes just in case we need to start rolling out the ones for the variants in case we don't get to this herd immunity threshold in time. We might start saying, okay, guys, well, we need to get this uh, variant that's spreading throughout the US like wildfire, like the UK variant under control because now that's the one that's the majority. So they, they are developing boosters um, just in case. Um, but again, the, we, don't, uh, we, we don't want to put the cart before the horse because um, we're hoping not to have to vaccinate against the variants because if we do, well, there's going to be more variants out there before we have a time to get the vaccine out. And so that's that's the race against time that we're facing right now. And what we can do again as a society, we need to keep those public health measures in place until we get to that herd immunity threshold or we are putting ourselves at great risk. As the CDC director says, impending doom. Uh, Angelo and everybody, I just uh, copied it a couple times um, throughout the chat, a link to the YouTube video of a previous presentation you did about COVID in January, which mm -hmm. then has the connection to the NWTC tube that we mentioned. So sometime soon, this presentation will also be on that same channel. That's correct. So I think I feel I can speak for Angelo. Feel free to share this presentation as you see fit. I hope that you'll all go out and um, and pass this message on, and and be warriors in the, the fight against myths and the the fight against COVID. Yep. And uh, I had a question in the chat about uh, boosters. Is that's why they came out with Prevnar and Shingrix and things like that? Yeah, because over time, right? If the immunity lasts 40 to 50 years and we live beyond 40 to 50 years, you might have to boost it later. And so hopefully we don't have to do that for COVID. Hopefully we can get ahead of the pandemic and get it out of existence sooner rather than later. And then hopefully we don't have to think about this seasonally like the flu and things like that. Um, but we, we still, um, according to most public health experts, have this one chance if we vaccinate enough of the community, we can get ahead of it and cause it to go extinct, or we keep it around, we keep on giving it ability to mutate, then, then all bets are up, it's just gonna be here. But we have the capability of getting rid of this virus if we work together as a society. Well, thank you from both of us for, for hanging around and, um... I'm listening to the entire presentation for all the engagement and questions. This has been fantastic. And like I said, please feel free to share this message um, on social media with your family and friends. Let's uh, let's kick this pandemic in the butt while we have a chance. Yep. 
You guys all have a great evening. Again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to stick around, but that is all we have for you today. We'll send out some messaging as we uh, get this recording downloaded. And, and again, feel free to share as much as you would like so that we can make a difference. You guys have a good evening.